A warm greetings to you from me, Colin, and the Southern Counties Baptist Association staff team. We are still living in the goodness as a family of the wedding celebration of our daughter Lucy to Josh. We were just simply glad that it could go ahead and we had the restrictions of 15 people for the wedding and 15 people for the reception and the reception had to be outdoors so it was in an open-sided marquee in the grounds of the hotel that we booked long ago for the celebration day. Some while ago we decided that if the wedding could take place we would simply make the most of whatever it was that we could we could do however we could be on the day and um, we were going to we were going to just celebrate whatever happened and make it a brilliant day for Lucy and Josh and all of us as we gathered. And that was a different sort of approach to one that had begun to dominate for us, which is what we couldn't do and who couldn't be there and uh, how we weren't able to celebrate. And uh, the fact that we couldn't sing or uh, dance or all of those different things that one that one begins to, to, to build up and concentrate on and let dominate. And it's reminded me, as I've reflected, on this contrast between feeling that there's lots that we can't do and aren't, uh, haven't got the resources for, or the people that we can't be with. And that's totally understandable and been a dominant theme during the whole of this pandemic time. And then another approach, which is um, the one that says, well, what is it that you can do and have got and are gifts and you can make the most of and who you can be with in whatever way you choose or are able to be with them? Those two contrasting sort of uh, trends and themes that we have in our own uh, hearts, but also as we talk with uh, with other people as well. And I find it, uh, both, both things are found in the Wedding at Cana story in John 2, which I want to make a few connections with. The first is the naming of the scarcity, and uh, it's Mary who does that in John 2. And uh, with the bold comment, we're already told that the wine has run out, with a bold comment, comment to Jesus, uh, there is no more wine. There is no more wine. And what I like about it is that once Jesus has had his own reaction, as he presumably prayerfully <laughs> thinks about what is being offered to him as a problem. What I like about it is that Mary doesn't give the solution. I do actually wonder what it is she thought might happen. Did she think that Jesus was organised um, uh, some people with donkeys to go to the nearest place that might have some supplies? Did she think that Jesus would assert his authority and say to people that the uh, celebration would have to come to a premature end? Did she think that he would organise a rationing system for what was still left? Did she think that he would take some personal responsibility and get himself and his disciples out of the way because they presumably had added to the extra pressure on the guest list and the wine that was available? Well, she only does one thing, which is she says to the servants, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. There's something absolutely vital about when we name the scarcity, when we acknowledge what we miss or what we haven't got or what we can't do, there's something vital about also not wanting immediately to find a solution, unless of course it's an emergency situation. She just tells Jesus and then she presumably walks away and leaves it with him. She'll benefit later from what Jesus does do. But in the meantime, she's not on the scene, at least the way John tells it. So something about us also being able to name our scarcity and what we feel we haven't got and who we're not able to be with, or perhaps who we haven't got in our church, what we haven't got in terms of our resources. All of those things, uh, it's right and proper that we get to name them. 
But there's a second aspect as well, which is when we've expressed our need or the scarcity, trusting and being willing to receive and make the most of the gift that Jesus does give, of the gifts that Jesus does make available. What I notice here is that actually this wedding uh, shifts into another gear as this vintage wine is rolled out around the reception. And what Jesus does is he, he affirms and underscores the importance of this wedding celebration. Of course, he protects the social embarrassment of the bridegroom, uh, who would have been the one that faced, uh, as it were, the uh, mutterings of the neighbours and the local village. But he enables the celebration to continue, not least because, and John's going to tell us this in several ways, not least because the world is headed for a wedding. John tells us this is the premier sign. It's the first sign. It, it's the one that underscores and uh, um, uh, uh, is the end, end game, as it were, of everything that Jesus brings and is going to be doing. The world is heading for a wedding. Revelation 21 tells us that, that actually there'll be a bride and uh, God matched and joined together. And uh, the mourning and the crying and the struggling and death are all finished. And all things are going to be made new. It's also here in John's uh, account because he tells us it's the third day. Well, actually, if you do the math, it's the, it's the fourth day. But actually, it's the third day, poetically at least. Um, and I'm sure there's some other explanation. But, but it, you know, the third day reminds us of resurrection life. The first big sign. There will be healings and, of course, Lazarus will be raised from the dead. There will be other sorts of signs, but this is the premier one. And it reminds us that uh, although we are not to, as it were, take this as the formula for living, this is a special occasion signalling a special vision, Still it is that actually God is the one that we come to when the scarcity and we receive the gifts that he gives to us. We know that this isn't the formula for how we should normally behave because when people sought Jesus because he'd fed, fed them on the hillside after a long day's teaching, uh, Jesus gives them short shrift and he says to them, actually, you're only here because I fed you because I gave you the bread. So it's not a formula, but it is actually part of one of the great signs of what God is doing. So as well as naming to Jesus where we sense lack and scarcity and uh, sadness about that and also need for him to provide, what would it be like if uh, with Mary we don't tell Jesus how he's supposed to respond to that, but we do receive whatever gift he brings? One of the gifts we had in this uh, lovely wedding celebration that we had, totally beyond our control, was it just was a very, very sunny, beautiful day. And we hadn't had many like that. And in fact, we'd had to book a heater because elderly grandparents uh, don't cope well with open-sided marquees. Um, but we didn't need to use it at all. So just a lovely providential gift from God of a beautiful day. And of course, we made the most of that by being outside a lot of the time, not just in the marquee. What are the gifts? What is the gift that God is giving to you and to you as a church? Or is it that he's already given something that you are not noticing? People, some sort of resources, some connections with your community as you want to help others to come to know and love Christ and certainly to receive his love for themselves. So hopefully some, um, some simple thoughts, but they're about how we might at this time, as we're waiting for everything to sort of shift into a different way of being together, with great thankfulness, by the way, uh, some thoughts about um, decision making over the next few days and few weeks and few months. Yes, naming where there's something we haven't got or are not able to do, but also trusting and looking out for the gift and the gifts that God is bringing about, who we have got, who we are connected with, what we can do, 
and then making and then making the most of them. May God bless you as you do that. Amen.